here. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen in all its entirety. Um, um, okay. So um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. Um, so since it's already halfway into the um, uh, conference workshop, I thought I'd start by giving a brief recap of uh, what we have probably seen so far and uh, what I am, how it, it's related a bit to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so uh, we have seen uh, various applications of machine learning. Uh, the most recent one being uh, last night's uh, use of uh, interatomic potentials uh, in conjunction with molecular dynamics and sampling techniques to study uh, a complex system. Uh, I think a follow-up talk today is about coarse grain descriptions. Um, but as you all have probably seen by now, uh, there, there's no shortage to the applications of atomistic machine learning. And uh, on the left here, I tried to show a brief uh, summary of what ingredients are necessary for atomistic machine learning. So these models, so basically we have a training set, so which comprises of structures and uh, a model, uh, which is accompanied by reference calculations of properties that you're interested in training. So um, maybe you're interested in training uh, interatomic inter potential. So you have calculations for energy and forces and whatever else. And this is provided to the machine, machine learning model in uh, the form of a suitable representation. And uh, this will be the focus of today's talk. Um, and when I say suitable representation, uh, you have already, I think, encountered uh, so power spectrum, pi spectrum, and so on. Um, so just to give a brief background of what they are. So you basically start with Cartesian coordinates of your structure because that's what you're given from, uh, that's what you start with. You have a structure and it's Cartesian coordinates. And um, when I say a relevant representation, um, you see here uh, in the leaves of these trees, this tree, you, you have various representations, the names of various representations. And um, some of which you've already seen, symmetry functions, uh, A's, moment tensor potential, so. And um, all of these are more or less related to each other. Uh, they come from different families uh, of descriptors, all starting from the Cartesian coordinates and how they uh, are derived. So we do a bunch of operations, operations on them. Um, and these operations are usually symmetry operations. Um, there are other things involved, but today I'll mostly be focusing on symmetry operations. So what kind of symmetries are we talking about here? So remember that uh, all of these um, representations emerged or the field emerged in the context of learning energies. So uh, to begin with, uh, let's say we have the structure where I have in, uh, denoted in different colors, the different species of atoms. And uh, just as a shorthand notation, I uh, call this structure A as uh, A written in a cat form. And then, um, so what we want, uh, we want to be able to describe the energy of this uh, system um, independent of the origin. So we want to get rid of the redundancy of where we place the origin in our coordinates. One way to do that is just center yourself on the structure, on the atom itself. So if you move the atom, you move along, you move your reference frame along with the atom. So the uh, coordinates don't change. And this is what uh, we formally called an atom-centered environment. So um, incorporating translation symmetry results in something called an atom-centered decomposition. So you basically have for each atom an environment which I have denoted with these little dotted circles. Um, another symmetry of interest is um, permutation of um, identical nuclei. So um, it shouldn't matter if I call this um, A, B or B, A, the energy is not going to change uh, based on my labeling of the uh, structure. So that's one other symmetry. And then, uh, since energy is a scalar property, it should not change with the rotation of your structure. Um, so these are some symmetries and there's also inversion and maybe other properties you can think of. Um, but um, so usually we uh, construct representations which also have 
uh, machine learning representations, which derive from Cartesian coordinates, which also obey the same symmetries. Um, so here I usually, I am going to show this in a bracket notation, which is basically we, uh, in our lab, uh, we have developed this unified framework of writing representations, kernels, and uh, all models using this bracket notation, uh, which you'll see a lot in this uh, talk. Uh, but don't get scared. Uh, it's uh, just a way of writing things uh, which have some meaning. So um, here, uh, since we are working with atom-centered densities, uh, I'm writing the density as rho i, so i being the atomic center. And then uh, there is this exponent, um, which tells you how many neighbors of this uh, center i you're considering. So for this um, rho i one, I have this central atom and then I'm considering one neighbor in my environment. And then I average over rotations of this uh, pair distance. So um, this exponent is called the correlation order. And so um, you can consider correlations of second order, which means you're looking at the central atom and two other atoms in your neighborhood and averaging over rotations of, over all of them. And this gives you information about triangles, basically. So it gives you information about two distances and one angle. Uh, and this is also what is most commonly uh, referred to in the soap power spectrum. Uh, and then uh, there's nothing stopping you. You can go up to, in general, new order correlations. And uh, we will see them again shortly. Um, but basically, there is this hierarchy that you can use to learn, use as representations in your models for energies or scalar properties. Uh, which have these symmetries. So, so far so good. Uh, but what about if you want to learn properties which have a more complex structure? Uh, what if you're interested in learning dipole moments? So um, this complex structure, which I'm talking about is something called an equivariant structure. So what, what, do, what do I mean by this? So um, if we have energy, so for example, today we are talking about rotational equivariance. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, if you have a structure which with energy E and you ro rigidly rotate this entire structure, the energy being a scalar property does not change. So it's something that is invariant under uh, rotations. At the same time, if uh, for this water molecule, uh, I have a property which, for example, let's say is a dipole moment uh, represented by a vector uh, and it, it has these three Car Cartesian components, uh, it rotates under uh, it rotates as the structure rotates. So equivariance is precisely this property that whatever you're trying to, your target rotates with the structure. Um, and just to show um, its mathematical structure, we um, usually write this as this column vector of uh, your rotated property is obtained by a rotation matrix multiplied on the original vector. And um, so in this form, and this property is indexed by this one sub-index. So it's called a rank one tensor. So as many indices you have on your, uh, on, in the subscript here, it's called a rank n tensor. Um, so in general, uh, you can have uh, whatever rank tensor you're interested in. Uh, so in Cartesian form, and you have to account for rotation of each of these indices. Uh, that seems like a scary thing uh, to do, uh, how to capture this. So for example, uh, usually uh, I'm going to explain here is uh, what is usually also known as the polarizability ellipsoid. Uh, so polarizability is a rank two tensor. It can be written as a three by three matrix. So it has in total nine elements, right? And uh, to, to observe its rotational behavior, you need to have these two uh, matrices multiplying this to obtain the rotated polarizability matrix. Uh, instead, if we were somehow able to manipulate this matrix and uh, write this in terms of these three, um, this decomposition where I have P uh, with superscript zero, one, and two, I don't tell you how I obtained this, but it's related somehow to these, uh, ele these uh, elements of this matrix. So where um, uh, the superscript basically tells you that this, uh, object rotates like a spherical harmonic of that order. Um, so how this helps us basically is that instead of having to worry about this multiplication of two rotational matrices, you decompose your matrix into uh, compositions which rotate independently of each other. So you have a scalar, 
which is which which does not rotate uh, under uh, rotation then you have something that rotates like a vector or a spherical harmonic of order one and then you have something that rotates like a spherical harmonic of order two and the nice thing about them is that they rotate independently of each other so you can obtain in this form the uh, rotated um, polarizability as independent rotations of these sub parts and um, this is basically called the irreducible rep spherical representation of your property um, which can uh, be really useful and we'll see how um, so now uh, let's talk a bit about how to learn them uh, so we have so far uh, property we have we have seen already models for learning energies uh, which is an invariant property so it does not rotate and I write this as a spherical harmonic of order zero because it's a scalar, it's, a, it's like a sphere, it does not change under rotation. So we have used invariant representation. So again, if you recall this figure, this is a new equals two. So the second order correlation of your atom density features. Um, on the other hand, if you want to learn a property which we have decomposed as we've seen on the previous slide uh, as a sum of uh, these irreducible components, um, which can be indexed by lambda and mu, um, so you recall, we decompose the polarizability matrix into P0, P1, P2. Each of uh, them can be learned separately using a representation that corresponds to a rotational behavior of the equivalent lambda mu. So that helps us, uh, instead of having to worry about learning the whole matrix together, we learn separate sublocks of it. And uh, why this is helpful? So uh, let's see, um, so let's consider a very basic linear regression model, okay? Um, so we are basically interested in writing a property Y of structure A as sum over some weights Q, uh, sum over some functions Q with um, weight uh, WQ times some function Q of that structure. So in, in the bracket notation that we've been using so far, we basically write this as um, a property Y of structure A as weights correspond to y uh, bracket yq and the representation corresponds to this. Um, so if y is a scalar property like energy, uh, this is what we've seen so far. Um, the representation is in uh, if you rotate, if you apply rotation matrix on both sides of this equation, the left hand side does not change because y is a scalar property. Um, the structural representation also is invariant because you have constructed it to be so. So you learn your property with the corresponding representation, which is invariant. Now, if you uh, do the same thing with a property that, that behaves like a spherical harmonic of order lambda mu, then um, we write it like this. So property of Y of A with behavior lambda mu. And um, this we, ha we have written a representation for this as well. So using the same set of weights. So the weights here are invariant. If you rotate on both sides, you have a rotation of your property and rotation of your representation, which both they both rotate the same way. So you learn weights which are invariant. So basically, it uh, reduces the burden of learning weights which have to change as you change your uh, uh, property. Um, so the only downside to that is you have to write your property in a way that corresponds to this y lambda mu form. So you have to massage your properties from Cartesian form into a form that can be written as Y lambda mu. So for example, a vector is a rank one tensor. So um, you have the superscript one, and then uh, you can write zero, one, minus one. So these are related. I mean, there are ways how to go from Cartesian to spherical form, uh, which are very well known in uh, quantum uh, mechanics. And then at the end, you basically have uh, just in a um, linear regression form, you, um, you're optimizing your weights um, given, uh, given a reference and prediction uh, with some uh, extra external factor. And so you're learning these weights on your test structure, uh, training structures and using it to predict on your test structures. And uh, this is what we'll see in the tutorial as well today. Um, so this is uh, just for uh, paucity of time, I will not delve a bit more into how to construct features for, um, for uh, equivariant properties, but uh, we recently figured out that 
since uh, we are constructing features which which behave like spherical harmonics, we can use the rules of angular momenta addition uh, to combine different types of features and go higher in correlation order. Uh, so you will, um, if you want, you can try to um, go from uh, mu equals one correlation features to a lambda soap-like feature, which uh, which basically is so power spectrum, which rotates uh, like spherical harmonics. And um, the final part of my talk today is uh, uh, going to be about learning um, properties which have more than uh, one center. So, so far I've talked to you or you have seen in this uh, workshop properties which are indexed by a single center. So we have, um, we have been learning energies, for example, and then energies of total structures, but we learn them as individual atomic contributions. So we learn uh, with each atom-centered representation and atom-centered contribution by I. Um, but in general, uh, you might have properties, um, for example, Hamiltonian atomic orbital basis, n-body density matrices, transition states, which uh, explicitly depend on multiple centers. So uh, for example, here you have a property that depends on two centers, or you can have something that depends on three centers. Uh, in general, you can have n centers. Um, so in addition to all the uh, symmetries that we have seen so far, there's an additional symmetry that pops up when you talk about more than one center, which is permutation equivariance. So you want your, um, so in general, the property changes when you change the index of uh, the atoms here. So. Um, like, for example, if you're looking at transition energy from state one to two, it is going to be the negative of, of the transition from two to one, That's a simple example. Um, so in general, you want your, uh, since the property changes, you want the representation which learns this also to change behavior under permutation of atoms. Um, so this is something we have to build in, into our um, representation now. And uh, I'll not explain to you all the gory details, um, but what we do basically is we um, tag the individual atoms that we are interested in, and then um, we multiply this. And um, so the tagged atoms basically tells us that, okay, these are the atoms that uh, control our property. And then for each pair, or well, for example, today we'll be looking at uh, Hamiltonian matrices. So we have pair, um, uh, two center representation or a pair feature. And then for each pair of atoms, you can de describe an environment like you were describing the environment of a single center. And for each, so just like before we have um, a pair and then we can, so we have two Gaussians telling us that these are the atoms that we are interested in. And then to define the environment, we take, uh, take the correlation with new uh, and other uh, neighbors. So it's like before, just we have tagged the individual atoms. Um, so just as an example of uh, what could be interesting is um, the Hamiltonian in atomic orbital basis. So um, if I, with this representation, I'm trying to say that we have uh, orbital NLM centered on atom I, uh, N prime L prime M prime centered on I prime. And, um, a is basically tells us the species of those atoms which we are centering on. So if you lost track of what I just said, uh, don't worry. Uh, there's an example coming up for uh, to catch up again. Uh, but in general, in uh, quantum chemistry, you're interested in solving this eigenvalue equation, um, which um, uh, here, so here we have the, so here we particularly talk about the Hartree matrix. And um, so E's are the energies. Um, so it, in general, you can learn this generalized eigenvalue equation, or you can do something called a Loudon orthogonalization and learn the Hamiltonian in this equation. Um, in the tutorial, I think I um, tell you how to learn this Hamiltonian, but you could do either. Um, so this was just for information. If you got confused, we discuss that again later. Um, but in general, I mean, here I show you a Hamiltonian uh, for water molecule. So a Hamiltonian matrix is symmetric, uh, it's Hermitian. Uh, and so in real space, it's also symmetric. And um, you can basically um, divide your Hamiltonian into blocks. For example, 
um, you can have, so what these blocks correspond to. So you have a matrix elements between orbital centered on atoms of different species. So between O and H. Uh, you can have elements between um, atoms of the same species, but there are two different atoms. So between H1, H2. Or you can have uh, elements which where both the orbitals are centered on the same atom. So you can have uh, elements uh, both on the same hydrogen, same oxygen, and so on. So um, there is the, the permutation symmetry arises from the fact that um, if you simultaneously exchange both the atom and the orbitals, so if you swap these two completely, you basically are looking at the image in the symmetric part. So if you're looking, um, basically the element in the upper triangular maps to the uh, element in the lower triangular half of the matrix. Uh, on the other hand, if you only exchange the orbitals and not the atom themselves, so basically it gives you these two elements which are highlighted by the star. In general, they are not related by any symmetry whatsoever. So this basically tells you that you need um, a separate representation to be able to capture this uh, permutation equivariance, right? You cannot do this with a single center if you if you only have information about a single at atomic center. Um, so let's look at this a bit more in practice. So here we have the Hamiltonian of a water molecule. And here, just like before, I highlighted in different colors the different blocks uh, that are there. So for um, what I call the diagonal matrix elements, they are the um, elements where both the orbitals are centered on the same atom, like here. So they are the SS orbitals on the same atom. Then you can have uh, elements um, between atoms of different uh, of different species, and then um, yeah, elements on atoms of the same species. So these are offside uh, elements. So if you have uh, matrix elements between elements of the same species, you have to account for the fact that they uh, correspond to a permutation between identical nuclei. Um, right, because uh, there is no way beforehand to identify what you call H1 and what is H2. So uh, you have to account for the permutation of identical nuclei in this in this form. So you construct symmetrized and anti-symmetrized con uh, contributions of the Hamiltonian matrix. Um, and that's what is shown in this figure. Okay. So um, it so far it was. I was being a bit, I was cheating a bit and showing you only elements of the uh, SS orbitals. Uh, but uh, just like before, when I showed you this polarizability matrix that decomposed into separate blocks that rotated separately, you can do the same trick in general with the Hamiltonian matrix between uh, orbitals of different, uh, of which are more than just uh, S orbitals. So for example, here I show you a block between a P block, so L equals one, and a D block. So in general, if I zoom in a bit, it basically looks like a between elements between a P block and D block. And um, just like we were doing before with the polarizability matrix, so we saw a square matrix decomposed into different lambda contributions. You can do the same with your matrix here uh, using, uh, again, these cleft cordon uh, product decomposition. And so you basically, instead of having to learn this entire 15, uh, 15 elements of this matrix together, you decompose this into a part that you only have to learn three, uh, three elements at a time, then five elements, and then seven. So the sum of the elements to here corresponds to all the elements here. Um, and then um, you have to assemble them back together to get your original Hamiltonian. So um, since we learned something that is the matrix, we can uh, look at the error on the eigenspectrum and say, okay, this is how well we were able to learn the matrix itself. Uh, then uh, we can compute the error on the whole matrix, or we can, uh, since we uh, identify these different types of blocks between, depending on the species of atoms on which the orbitals were centered, we can compute errors on the blocks and see, okay, maybe we are learning one block better than the other. Um, so, you will see this today in the tutorial. Um, and then uh, I will leave you with results that are in this paper that was uh, recently submitted. Uh, so you will be able to actually um, see this figure in the tutorial today. So basically what it's trying to show here is that is the power of the representation itself. 
So um, what is shown is in this figure is that here is a water molecule that is slightly distorted. So the bond length between uh, one and three is different from the bond length between one and two. Uh, then I learned the uh, Hamiltonian matrix A of this structure. And then uh, I have this other structure here uh, in B, the inset. So what happened here was that I just rotated the structure and I swapped the hydrogen atoms. Um, now, since I used a representation that was uh, equivalent with permutation and rotations, uh, if I learned only this matrix and I only learned one single matrix, um, I was able to learn how they transform because I used uh, this, they transform exactly like the spherical harmonics of the orbitals involved, as I showed you in the previous slide. So your model learned that the elements have to rotate a certain way, uh, but in doing so, it also learned the eigenspectrum itself. So by just training on one structure, I am able to learn the fact that the eigenvalues do not change under this operation. So your model inherently knows from representation itself that the eigenvalues are invariant to permutation and rotation of, uh, of your structure. So in blue dots here, uh, you see the eigenvalues uh, of this matrix. And in the red uh, lines, you see the prediction on uh, the structure and they map up to machine precision. Um, and if you do this as a learning exercise, so for, for all machine learning uh, models, you make something called a learning curve where you increase the exposure of uh, your model to, to your training structures. So here I went from, uh, I think 20 to up to about 800 structures and you see that different blocks, uh, how the error on different blocks looks like. So it, it helps you uh, track a bit about which blocks do better, which blocks do worse. And then uh, you can look into more details why they behave a certain way. Um, and then uh, maybe this also you can try in the tutorial today. Um, the last thing I, I want to say is uh, that this maps a bit to quantum chemistry. And um, I am saying this without being a quantum chemist. But um, once you have, uh, so in quantum chemistry, you once you have I, um, this learned this complete nuclear permutation and inversion group, um, you have accounted for all the molecular point group symmetries. Um, so since the representation that we built here incorporates um, rotations, inversions, permutation between atoms, we somehow in, uh, built in the, using this uh, incorporation of symmetries, the molecular symmetries into our representation. So um, for all the molecular chemists in the audience uh, who probably understand this better than I do, um, so here, basically, we have a matrix that was for benzene in, in a minimal atomic orbital basis. And so, um, so this matrix was uh, built artificially. So we just make, made a random uniform matrix. So the elements themselves do not mean anything. And then uh, we uh, made a representation for the molecule and then learned the single matrix. So now when you predict, um, using your machine learning model, a linear regression model based on the representation, you get the matrix on the right. Now, obviously the matrix elements look different because you made an artificial matrix where the elements do not have this uh, symmetry of spherical harmonics. Um, but what's interesting is that your model still learned the fact that uh, because of this uh, equivariance of the representation itself, it turned the eigenstructure of uh, of your Hamiltonian matrix. So it learned that, okay, the, um, the eigenvalues should be degenerate or they should, uh, they should have this amount of degeneracy. And then uh, as with the Jan Teller effect, uh, it also learns that if you distort your molecule, um, the eigenvalues uh, should cross each other and how they should cross each other. So this I thought was a very, um, so this I think is a very, um, um, okay, what's the right word? <laughs> Very um, favorable argument uh, for machine learning with the right amount of symmetries. And um, it tells you that, okay, you don't need to um, 
basically here you see a mapping from the symmetries that you inbuilt into the model to what you expect to be in the output. And um, with that, I mean, um, basically uh, just to motivate you that we are not just learning matrices because we have uh, X amount of time on our hands, we actually have, uh, we can use this somewhere. So once you have learned uh, Hamiltonian matrices, you can use this um, to precondition self-convergent cycles. Or uh, once you have the ability to learn n-center properties, you can also learn um, three or four center integrals that can help quantum chemistry codes to reach convergence. And then uh, once, uh, because uh, the elements themselves are related to absorption spectra and spin orbit couplings, you can also use this for excited state machine learning. And uh, the end message that I want to leave you with today is that once you have incorporated the right amount of physical insight, once we, like basically you have to strive to find a balance between the symmetries that you incorporate in your model um, that can maybe help reduce the burden on the model itself to learn the symmetries. Um, you basically, uh, with the right balance of quantum chemistry and uh, uh, machine learning, you reach somewhere. Uh, that help makes your life easier. And uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, in the group uh, for their, uh, like who helped me a lot with the work that I presented today and uh, to this workshop as well. Uh, so with that, I reached the end of my talk. Um, so I don't know if we do questions before or we uh, jump to the tutorial first. Oh, that's up to you, Jagya. So if you think you want to have questions now, or, or if you think they will make more sense later on, that's really up to you. Um, okay, maybe then I uh, show you the tutorial as well. Um, I mean, yeah. Which is where? Oh, no. So um, maybe, uh, so basically I tried to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between my talk and what is there in the tutorial itself. So um, I hope you can see uh, this. So uh, everything seems to work fine here, except uh, sometimes it gives me an error when I go towards the very end uh, that I progress has not been found. So if you encounter that error, uh, I left in comment how to resolve that as well. Uh, yeah. So usually when you're running regression for uh, for the Hamiltonian learning, uh, it usually gives an error. And if it does, you can uncomment this cell and rerun your entire notebook. It should not be very heavy. Um, but before that, um, so in this tutorial, um, basically uh, it's built on top of uh, Libraskel, which Felix already introduced to you on day one. So uh, there are some additional uh, uh, there's some additional code in Python uh, that is uh, the files are in this directory here. So there is a regression utils uh, dot pi which has uh, this linear regression model that I showed you and how to train it for uh, for an equivalent property. So here, for example, um, I tell you a bit about more about how to decompose your Cartesian tensor into spherical tensors. And then, um, so there is inbuilt functionality in Libraskel now to go from a Cartesian tensor to spherical ones. So here we are loading Cartesian, uh, uh, dipole moments and polar polarizabilities. And then you can decompose them using the x, y, z to spherical function. So this should be done. And then, um, then you basically start uh, constructing your representation using the uh, spherical expansion coefficients. So I leave you in the um, uh, text here also references where you can find more details uh, on how it's uh, constructed and so on. So you're not uh, just going by what I'm saying. Uh, because in science, you should always find uh, <laughs> ways to corroborate what is being told. Uh, so um, 
Um, there is a bunch of hyperparameters that you uh, describe to construct your representation. I think Felix already talked about this. If not, I'm happy to take uh, uh, comments, questions on this as well. Um, so here basically, um, so you should not take for granted that the representation that you construct is equivalent. So here I'm uh, giving you a way to check how if the features actually rotate the way you expect them to. So for example, here I selected a frame that's frame eight of all the frames that I loaded before. And then I select the Lambda. So I selected Lambda equals one. So uh, spherical tensor of order one because we are working here with typo moments, which are vectors. Um, so um, basically here with uh, this, uh, these two lines here, I get the features for this frame. So here we basically loading um, a trajectory random uh, configuration of water molecules. So all the frames, they correspond to water molecules. And then uh, you construct features here for one frame of water molecule, and then you define a, an arbitrary rotation. So here, this is uh, arbitrary rotation itself. And then uh, you can check that you, uh, so how to check if your uh, features rotate as you expect. So you have structure A, then uh, you construct the features of structure A. What you do next is you rotate structure A to get structure B. You generate features of structure B. Now, what should happen is if your features are equivalent, the features of structure A should rotate the same way as, uh, as, as corresponding to the rotation you applied from structure A to B. So this is what we are checking here. So first we generated um, features of this frame. Then um, we rotated this frame and we generated its features. And now we are checking if, the uh, if we rotate the features, we get exactly what we expect or not. And uh, here you up to machine precision, you get that the features map. So you get a way to generate features that are equivalent with rotations. And um, this is what was the idea behind Lambda SOAP. Um, so here is the link to a reference uh, that describes this further. And um, then uh, just as we, um, I, I just briefly glossed over this in the talk uh, because I didn't want to take up too much time for this. Um, but it basically it shows you how to construct features of, uh, of any correlation order starting from a lower correlation order. So here um, we can check if uh, the Lambda SOAP feature maps uh, by uh, maps the feature that you get by combining two uh, density correlation equals one feature or not. Uh, I mean, eventually we're interested in whether this is able to learn the property of interest or not. So, uh, if uh, so, this is just uh, for being uh, very pedagogical. You don't need to do this part. What maybe you're more interested in is if your model behaves the way you expect it to or not. So here we are doing regressions um, using these features. So I generated features here up to the first 50 structures uh, just because I tested this first on my own uh, computer and I didn't want it to uh, be very slow. <laughs> so you can here uh, increase this uh, up to, I think, a thousand structures. So the frames here, they have, uh, like a thousand structures in them. And then, um, so we um, generate features. Then you have uh, your property, which you have already converted to spherical tensorial form. And here it's uh, using um, the utilities in equivariant regression utils to, uh, you, to, to use the model that I described in the slides uh, to learn the dipole moment. And here you see that, uh, okay, it performs very well. Uh, it learns absolutely perfectly. Uh, <laughs> so that is the caveat to this. So uh, the first um, few structures in, in this frames list is uh, they are just rotated with respect to each other. And uh, you don't need this because you're, uh, it's just to test. I mean, I just included some rotated structures just as a test. Uh, so um, yeah, you can use this other file, which uh, where I randomize the structure. So you can, uh, you yeah, then you don't get very perfect performance. You will have uh, some, I mean, some error. It will not be absolutely perfect. 
and then um, there is a way. Um, so then the, in this um, MLIP data, uh, there's also some Python files, um, Python code for constructing uh, M center representation. So here, when I say M center, it's actually just two centers. Um, so again, this code is not publicly available yet. Uh, we are working on pushing this out after we have made some uh, changes, uh, final changes, corrections. So I would, uh, yeah, request you to not share it outside of this uh, workshop. Um, so again, we start with the same hyperparameters that we used above. Um, and then you load up. So again, we are doing this on water molecule and we are learning the um, fork matrix of uh, water molecules in, in, some, in a basis um, which is defined uh, in here. So you have the orbitals corresponding to each uh, atom type. So you have orbitals for oxygen and uh, hydrogen in this file. And you can see, uh, if I can see that, oh, I should have checked that. Okay. So um, yeah, it, it shows you here that for oxygen, you have 2s, 3s, 2p1, 2p minus 1, 2p0, and so on uh, orbitals for oxygen. And then for hydrogen, you just have 1s, 2s. So this is some basis that we chose arbitrary. Well, it's not an arbitrary decision, but uh, it's, uh, it's a basis that we chose. And then, um, if I go back here. So Jigyasa, just to. So, yeah. So I think we have around 15 minutes left. So, okay. And oh, I mean, I, I, questions. So yeah, yeah, sure. Use that information to pace yourself in okay. July. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, I would uh, just let everyone play with the, so yeah, usually you have this error, but if you run this cell, it goes away. So you should be, yeah, I will just say that you should be able to get exactly the figures that I showed you in the slides for water. So you can see that the eigenvalues are predicted the same and so on. But yeah, I will take questions now and uh, then we can go back to the tutorial. Okay, thanks, Vigas. That was really a very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, so, do we have questions? Uh, Edgar has a question. Yeah. You can unmute yourself. Right yeah. now. Uh, first of all, thanks, Vigas. Thanks, Edgar. Um, I noticed that in the figure where you're showing the learning curves for different blocks of your mm -hmm. um, Hamiltonian or Fock, Hamiltonian matrix, there was one that was much easier to learn than anything else. Yes. Uh, can you can you give me some intuition as to why that, uh, what that so, is? So it oh, okay. So it looks easier to learn, uh, but what I'm plotting here are absolute errors, so they are not. Right. So this okay. is this block is constructed by difference of the matrix elements, so they are in general lower than all the other blocks. Right, that makes sense. Right, so basically you're saying the the inherent variance of uh, yeah uh, this block is so much lower that. Mm -hmm. it so if, I mean, I I did this check. I plotted everything relative to the variance of individual blocks, and they are almost the same. Oh, okay, okay, that explains it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other question? Okay. Uh, or, uh, Edgar, you have one. Yeah, can, one I, can, I, can I ask another one then yeah, maybe? Feel, feel free so to. The usual problem with these um, higher order correlation functions, I suppose, is that you end up um, even even if you contract them with increasing numbers of features, mm -hmm. um, so what, what's a rough guideline as to what I can get away with? So, um, 
I'm, fa I'm familiar with the usual kind of uh, two body, three body correlation functions. And, and I know that I can build um, feature matrices for say a, a few thousand structures containing uh, say of the order of a few tens of atoms mm -hmm. in each frame. How does that change as I increase body order? Um, so what, yeah, what as, as you would expect the feature scale like exponentially with the correlation order, uh, that's for sure. So uh, we, uh, so I didn't explain this before, but we have this, what we call the nice scheme. So it's the n, n body and um, iterative contraction of equivalence scheme uh, that we uh, published last year. So in, in this basically, uh, so in this paper, uh, if you are interested, we show learning curves for the QM9 uh, data set mm -hmm. uh, with up to uh, fifth order correlation feature. So one okay. order higher than tri-spectrum. Okay. Um, Q, QM9, correct me if I'm wrong, but those are isolated molecules? Yeah. Okay. So I suppose um, at that point, we're talking about fairly small configurations. And if I was going to do the same thing for, the, say, condensed matter application, then I might yeah. run out of steam a bit earlier. Um, for condensed matter, I don't have a benchmark yet. Um, but basically, in this scheme, uh, what so this proposes basically, so since we know that the uh, features, uh, we can contract them using uh, angular momentum rules, we can go up to a higher order. Mm -hmm. But then the second part of this, comes in the fact that we contract at each order the uh, most important feature. So it helps you still be linear in the sense and uh, prevent this exponential increase in your features. Uh, so we currently implemented a PCA contraction at each step uh, to limit this uh, blow up of uh, features mm -hmm. as you increase the number of atoms. Uh, I suppose yeah. on top of that, one could consider um, performing feature sparsification that's actually driven, say, uh, 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 to some degree by knowledge of the target property as well. Along yeah, the yeah, yeah. We briefly discussed with Rose the other day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, thank you. Thank you. Oh, do we have any other questions? Yep, uh, Sean has a question. Oh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, so I saw, I mean, at some point you were relating your, I think it was the Brockhead notation to the SOAP descriptor. Mm -hmm. um, could you um, explain that one more time? I, I just, yeah, I didn't fully understand, but. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh went over that very quickly because I didn't want to want this to be uh, just about the notation. Um, so um, so here, um, I mean, so you can, well, if I'm not able to explain that fully, you can read more about the notation in this uh, recent, well, now it's you know, earlier this year, this review was uh, uh, published by uh, Felix and all. Uh, so um, what uh, we do here, so in this um, bracket, uh, you have rho centered on atom i, so you index by i, and then exponent is correlation order. Then in the bra, you have um, the species of the um, atoms in the neighborhood that you're considering. Um, so yes, I think yesterday, uh, I think Burke uh, uh, proposed, well, he showed this notation C and LM uh, C, right? So basically, this is what uh, this bracket stands for. It's C and L M. So C being so C being this coefficient of projection of your density on an L M basis. So a basis of radial functions and spherical harmonics. And then uh, so uh, so this overline corresponds to the fact that you averaged over all rotations. It's why I have this integral over all rotations here. And then um, so so power spectrum is basically C and L, L, L1, M1, M1, C and 2, L2, M2. And then uh, they, it's because it's rotationally symmetrized, you have a, a, um, a constraint on the Ls themselves. And then you can do this in general for an order correlation. Uh, was that a bit more clear? I, I, think, I think I mostly understand it. Um, 
so one thing I'm curious about still is uh so I understand for with soap one of these um coefficients here will be the overlap between different uh n1 and 2 mm -hmm. um but it has the same um that's at the same center like the same uh soap center uh so what i'm not fully understanding about these uh n center mm -hmm. representations is um so is this still at the same center the the i'm, I'm not sure if i'm asking this question i think i see your your uh, your confusion so um, so what you're basically, um, so here, when we are constructing, uh, and uh, like, let's say in the so power spectrum, we have the central atom I, and then we are looking at second order correlation. So we look at two other neighbors in the environment, right? And then uh, yeah. fill index with respect to atom I. Now, in when I construct a pair feature, so when it's a two center feature, what I do, basically, so basically, uh, in this two center feature, I count one of the neighbors as my other center, right? So you, I, I see the confusion why that can arise, right? Okay, your um, so power spectrum can also be a two center feature. And you're, yeah, you're partially right. So we, uh, when we do the maths, it turns out that uh, if you demote one of the uh, neighbors to, to being a center, you yeah, you can relate the so power spectrum to a two center feature. And uh, it, it, it is shown mathematically in, in, in this paper. Uh, but yeah, you're right, because we are still accounting for two centers and one extra neighbor. So they are related to each other. Okay, I got gotcha. So so it ends up still being related because and you can it's shown there. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, is there another question? Okay. If there are no other questions, I would uh, encourage people to look at the notebooks yeah. and. Uh, I, I actually had a question. Okay. Uh, and if you want, I can also play devil's advocate in terms of being critical. Okay. Yeah. So, so for example, a, a reason why a lot of people do machine learning is to, uh, is basically to feed in data and to get out a model, right? And the more symmetries we add, the more we need to know about the, the system that we are studying. You know? And I think you talked a bit about finding a balance between how much information about the system you want to incorporate, you know, yeah. and how much you want to let the machine do the work. So what exactly is, where, where do you, where have you struck this balance and what, and what are the complexities associated with, let's say, uh, including all of these symmetries? Oh, um, so, okay, I can answer maybe uh, in context of my most recent uh, yeah, 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 yeah. the Hamiltonian learning. So if you compare uh, the results that we have here mm -hmm. to another work where, where uh, they do not account explicitly for symmetries, but instead they, they instead feed the model with a bunch of uh, structures and expect the model to learn the symmetry. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, it needs, I think, a more complex structure. So it's why you see the rise of uh, deep uh, learning models uh, instead. I think uh, if you, so here and instead we are using just linear regression. Um, so I think uh, at that point, you have to weigh a bit on how, how much uh, calculation time and uh, how much uh, cost you can incur uh, as well. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, here, basically, I ran this in two hours. I got everything, starting from reference calculations to the end fitting. Everything works in less than two hours. Um, and the, the um, most striking fact is that even with just one structure, I'm able to get these uh, symmetries that I'm interested in. Uh, like the model already knows what, what it should expect. 
uh, I don't think a model which with no information about symmetries can do this. Uh, so that's maybe something to consider as well. No, I mean this is definitely highly efficient, and I think that it's it's it's. I I was really intrigued to see like the yarn teller distortions that you're seeing, and mm -hmm. yeah, that was very nice. But what I was really wanted to ask is, for example, is there an associated memory requirement or computational scaling with the inclusion of, let's say, these symmetries? I think it depends on. Uh, so here, uh, I mean, I haven't done this with uh, with a model that has no symmetry. Instead, I can only compare this to a, a deep learning network that has already been published by someone else, uh, sure. and uh, I don't know. Somehow, to me, uh, at least for water molecule, it's uh, it, it's no it's no require no additional requirement at all. I can learn uh, do this on my eight GB uh, RAM Mac uh, and get away with it. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think if anything, uh, in incorporating the symmetry lowers the burden and lowers the uh, training requirements and so on. At least that's my experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah, should I stop sharing then? Yeah, I think at, at this point we could actually thank Jigyasa for this very nice talk and a uh, very n novel and uh, new uh, application of machine learning, which is where we are definitely going to make a difference in the future. And at this point, we could take a 10 minutes break and be right back. Thanks a lot, Digas, again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.